Good morning, Venture Church. We are so glad that you are here joining with us today. Uh, I hope that you will sing along with us and just really enjoy the service this morning. Let's get started. Through you, I can do anything. I can do all things. Because it's you who gives me strength. Nothing is impossible. Through you, my eyes are open. Strongholds are broken. I am living by faith. Nothing is impossible. Not gonna live by what I see. Not gonna live by what I Deep down I know that you're here with me. I know that you can do anything. To you I can do anything. I can do all things. Cause it's you who gives me something. Nothing is impossible to you. Strongholds are broken. I am living by faith. Nothing is impossible. See, I believe. Cause it's you who gives me strength Nothing is impossible to you My eyes are open Strongholds are broken I am living by faith Nothing is impossible I believe, I believe I believe, I believe in you
picture that you painted for me A love letter in the sky Story I could have had a really different story If you came down from heaven to restore wonderful to be able to say good morning to you every Sunday morning. I hope you had a very blessed week, and I hope uh, you know what an important part of our church family you all are. So as a family, we still can connect for, with those of you who aren't able to see us in person right now. You can always get your praises to us, your um, prayer requests, and any other information you have with, for us um, by going to our website at theventurechurch.com. You can email us at office at theventurechurch.com. And you can also text us at 602-775-6398. So connect with us. Stay connected. Keep checking in on each other. Keep blessing each other. And uh, let me pray for you. Dear Father, again we come to you this morning in praise and thanksgiving 
for we are in your hands, and we trust all of our lives in your hands, Lord. We know that you're in control. We also know that there was people right now, Lord, that are hurting, that uh, the finances are, are in trouble, um, their health may be uh, ailing, and Lord, whatever else it might be, we just pray for each person. We pray your blessing over them, your healing, your peace, your comfort, your strength, your wisdom. And uh, Lord, we, we ask for these things in trusting in your name, and all the glory goes to you. In Jesus' name, amen. And everyone, stay safe and stay healthy. George Galton Jr. became president of Wayne State University in the spring of 1972. Now, many universities at that time were plagued by budget cuts and student unrest, much like we're seeing today. Shortly after his appointment, he was asked, by a friend, how are you weathering the battles? Well, he pondered the question and he replied. He said, well, during the day, I'm under a great deal of stress, but at night, I sleep like a baby. That is, I sleep a few hours, I wake up, and then I cry some. I sleep a few more hours, I wake up, and I cry a little more. Hey, how'd you sleep last night? Well, good morning and welcome to our series that we're calling In the Battle. Now, the premise of our series is very important. You see, you have to fight for what's good. You have to fight to achieve it, and you have to fight to maintain it. Everything good in this life, whether it's faith or attitude or a mind or our habits, our friends, our kids, our country, our church, our government, everything good quickly deteriorates and turns into chaos unless you fight for it. Well, the title of our message today, you might think it's a strange one, but it's called Study War. Really, that's much more necessary than you might imagine. Why? Because the battle has arrived. Whether you like it or not, the battle is here. The battle for your life, for your children, for your faith, for our nation. And we have two choices. We can learn to fight or we can learn to lose. But there's way too much at stake to embrace defeat. I happened upon a quote this week from one of our founding fathers, John Adams, and it was a powerful quote. I wanted to share it with you this morning. He wrote, I must study politics and war so that my sons may have the liberty to study mathematics and philosophy in order to give their children the right to study painting, poetry, and music. I feel the same way. I feel that we've stood on the shoulders of brave men and women who studied politics and war before us. And their sacrifice has given us nearly 250 years of freedom and liberty, unparalleled on the earth. But it seems like today it's all on the line. The battle has arrived, and we are the generation that it seems to have come full circle. We are the generation that, once again, is going to have to study politics and war, lest we become the generation that surrenders to the radical forces of evil in the world. I'd like to take you on a journey this morning, an amazing journey. I'd like us to study war by studying one of the great battles of Bible history. The story is the one of Jehoshaphat. Now, the the story is actually more than just his life. It's a fascinating read. I'd like to encourage you to jot down 2 Chronicles Chapters 14 through 20. And you'll read the amazing story of Jehoshaphat and his father, King Asa. So before we begin with the story, let let me give you just a, a bit of background, a bit of context for their lives. You see, the Israelites, they were notorious for rejecting God. They would continually opt for the the pagan gods of Baal and Asherah. The the Israelites would erect these pagan sites on high places so that all over the nations of Judah and Israel, 
there would be these false gods, gods of Baal and Asherah. Now, Jehoshaphat's father, King Asa, he had a good heart for God. He spent his life tearing down these pagan places. He even fired his own grandmother, the queen, because she made a repulsive Asherah pole. Well, when Jehoshaphat became king of Judah, he followed the same tradition of tearing down these pagan high places. But one day, he makes a nearly fatal decision. You can read about it yourself, his alliance with the wicked king Ahab. Well, After this nearly fatal encounter, God appears to Jehoshaphat, and he gives him a very stern warning. Essentially, he tells Jehoshaphat, if, if you want me to fight with you, if you want me to fight for you, you're going to need to clean up your act which is exactly what Jehoshaphat does. Let's pick up the story in chapter 19, verses 4 through 7. The Bible says that Jehoshaphat went out among the people and he turned them back to the Lord, the God of their ancestors. And then he appointed judges in the land and he told these judges, consider carefully what you do because you're not judging for mere mortals but for the Lord who is with you whenever you give a verdict. Now let the fear of the Lord be on you. Judge carefully, for with the Lord our God there is no injustice or partiality or bribery. See, what what Jehoshaphat is doing, he's implementing a sweeping righteous revolution. It's sweeping throughout the land, but notice where he starts. He starts at the top with the highest officials, the judges. He puts the fear of God in them so that they will judge the people righteously. You might call it a kind of trickle-down righteousness. Jehoshaphat was cleaning and draining the swamp. Every place where he had influence, in his own life and in in the life of his nation, he was working at bringing back a righteous reformation. Now, that's a first necessary step. You see, if we want God to fight with us and for us, we've got to confront the swamp. Not the one in Washington, but the one in our own hearts. We mustn't ignore it. We must root it out, and we must eradicate it. Well, shortly after Jehoshaphat begins his reformation, he receives some terrifying news. Let's continue our story. Chapter 20, verses 1 through 4. After this, the Moabites and the Ammonites with some of the the Meunites came to wage war against Jehoshaphat. Some people came and they told Jehoshaphat, a vast army is coming against you. Alarmed, Jehoshaphat resolved to inquire of the Lord and he proclaimed a fast for all of Judah The people of Judah came together to seek help from the Lord. Indeed, they came from every town in Judah to seek him. You see, Jehoshaphat is horrified to discover that an army, but not just an army, it's a vast army. A vast army of ruthless barbarians are gathered outside the city. They appear to far outnumber him. And so he resolves, this time, to seek God first. So he proclaims a fast for all of Judah. The entire nation is called to seek God from this deadly and fierce enemy. But you might ask, why call a national time of prayer and fasting? Well, you see, Jehoshaphat had learned this lesson in his own life. He learned that you can't spend your life running away from God and then expect God to be there when you need him. You don't get to pursue the false gods when life is good and then expect to be able to call on the one true God when life gets hard. Their only hope was to turn from their sin and to come back to God, to return with prayer and with fasting. Jehoshaphat had learned that if you want God to be with you, your heart has to be with him. And so he calls for this period of prayer and fasting, and then God gives the answer. 
Let's continue our story. It's in Second Chronicles chapter 20, verses 15 through 17. And this is what the Lord says. He says, don't be afraid or discouraged because of this vast army. For the battle is not yours. The battle is God's. Tomorrow, march down against them. You will not have to fight this battle. Simply take up your positions. Stand firm and see the deliverance that the Lord will give you. Don't be afraid. Do not be discouraged. Go out to face them tomorrow, and the Lord will be with you. Now, that's good news. God has forgiven them, and he has restored them, and God is with them again. But better yet, God is willing to fight with them, to fight for them. But notice what God tells them. He tells them, don't be intimidated by the size of the enemy. Why? Because the Lord's going to fight this one. But they still had a part to play. They still had to get up in the morning and, and put on their fighting clothes. They still had to march right out there in front of the enemy, and they had to take their fighting position, sword and shield in hand, and they had to stand firm. As this vast army began to march against them, they had to stand firm and not retreat. Don't be afraid and don't be discouraged. God will fight for you. They had, they had to believe. They had to do what God had told them. And God would come through. He promised. So what do you suppose happens next? The most amazing thing happens in 2 Chronicles chapter 20, verses 21 through 23. Jehoshaphat appoints men to sing to the Lord and to praise God for the splendor of his holiness. And as they went out, now realize, as the singers went out, at the head of the army, saying, Give thanks to the Lord, for his love endures forever. And as they began to sing and praise, the Lord set ambushes against them. The Ammonites and the Moabites rose up against the men from Mount Seir to destroy and annihilate them. And after they finished slaughtering the men from Seir, they turned and destroyed one another. I don't know about you, but I have never heard in all of my life of of another battle like this one, one where the commander sends out the praise team in advance of the soldiers. Imagine the singers in front of the soldiers. It was a supreme act of faith. Jehoshaphat believed with all of his heart that God would fight this battle. And as the singers went forth, they sang the splendor of God's holiness. They sang of his goodness and of his mercy, his righteousness, his power, and his love. And as they sing, God sets an ambush. We'll have to get to heaven to find out the details of what this looked like and how God pulled this off. But, but God turns the Ammonites and the Moabites and the men from Mount Seir against each other and they essentially destroy one another. The army of Jehoshaphat has prevailed without lifting a single sword. Now, I don't know about you. No, I do know about you because you're just like me. That's how you want God to fight our battles. Well, speaking of battles, did you know there's an election coming up in just two days? <laughs> the battle has arrived. We can all feel it. We see it and hear it in the streets. We know it's come upon us. But here's one thing we also know, that no matter how this election turns out on Tuesday, this battle will not be over, not for a very long time. I'd like to take a few moments and I'd like to speak to you about this battle. I I feel a, a profound obligation from God to talk to you about what's happening in our world today because this is far more than just politics. This is deeply spiritual. This is a battle that's going to affect our children and our grandchildren and the generations to come. See, let me say to you first of all that the origin of this battle is right out of the pits of hell. How do I know that? Look at the seeds of it. Look at the fruit of it. It's rooted in rebelling or in rebellion. 
It's rooted in, in rioting and looting, tearing down the structures, tearing down the statues. The, the seeds of the rebellion we're seeing today were planted in the 1960s, and they've reached their fruition today. But I think it's important to put a name to this battle. Who, who are the enemies? Who, who, are the, who are the players? Who's fighting this battle? Well, it, it's more than a battle of Republican versus Democrat. This is a, a radicalized ideology from the left. Now, what does that mean? Well, it, it means that the battle we're experiencing today is, is rooted in a Marxist ideology. And whenever this battle has been fought, it always ends in blood, suffering, and misery. It's this movement that we're watching in our country today, it's, it's radical beyond anything that we've ever seen. If they win, we've already seen it happen, you and I will be forced to violate our religious beliefs or, per, or, or suffer, to conform with their social agenda. Unborn babies will be aborted right up to the moment of birth. It'll be a world where men can be women, where men can compete in, in the sports with women. It'll be a place where a man can choose to enter the bathroom of his choice. It'll be a, a world in which some of our sacred institutions, like family, will be, will be torn down and destroyed based on the false notion that America is systemically racist. The essential freedoms of speech and religion, the bearing of arms, which are already under attack, will leave us. This, radical, this radicalized movement from the left, it's clearly anti-God, it's anti-liberty, it's anti-constitution, and the list goes on and on. The values that have made this nation unique are under attack. But what's alarming about this army is its size, the, the vastness, the, the areas in which it has infiltrated and infected our nation. It's, in, it's infected almost all of the institutions of our land. Let, let me name some. The Democratic Party has been taken hostage by this ideology. Those who study this are saying to us that this is not the Democratic Party of years ago. It's not the Democratic Party of your fathers and your grandfathers, of even of your youth. But it's not just the Democrats. This ideology has infected much of the Republican Party as well. The Bushes, longtime Republicans, are not voting for the Republican candidate for president again. And, of course, we would have to mention most of the news outlets, Wall Street, Big Tech, the billionaires, Hollywood, corporate America, the universities, and a whole bunch of churches are equally infected with this ideology. There's money and there's power. There's influence behind it beyond anything that we've ever seen. And they are hell-bent on destructing everything that Western civilization has built over the past 250 years. The battle is here. But there's a vast army on the right. I, I, I'd like to talk to you about this vast army just for a moment. They're called the conservatives. Now, right away, if you're not up on this war, on this battle, right away you're thinking, oh, conservative, that's, that's a descriptor for male and white and, and straight and Bible-believing but, oh, you would be so wrong if you thought that. You need to know something about these new young conservatives. They are diverse in so many ways. There are Democratic conservatives. There are Republican conservatives. There are gay conservatives, Jewish conservatives. They're diverse in many areas, but they come together for one fight. And the fight is for America and her constitution. I, I listen to one of these young conservatives on YouTube. His name is Dave Rubin. Dave Rubin was a Democrat his entire life. He was a, rib a liberal and still is a liberal, and he's, and he's gay. But today he describes himself as conservative, liberal, and a gay. 
Now, I'm about as different from Dave Rubin as you could ever imagine. But we come together in one unified purpose to fight and defend this country and this constitution that our founding fathers gave us, that our God gave us. There's another young man that I listen to, another one of these young conservatives. His name is Ben Shapiro. We too are very, very different. He's Jewish. He comes from such a radically different background than I do. But yet we agree on one thing. We agree that this country is worth fighting for, preserving, and saving. In fact, I I would encourage you. I, I called all four of our children the other day, and I asked them to listen to a YouTube video from Ben Shapiro. It's only eight minutes long, and it very carefully crafts and explains the battle. It's only eight minutes long, and here's what it's called. Why I didn't vote for Trump in 2016 and why I voted for Trump in 2020. It's a clear descriptor of the battle. But but what do we need? Well, certainly we can be excited and encouraged by these young conservatives that are rising up to fight this battle with us. But what we need is God. We need the assurance. We need the confidence that, that God is fighting this battle with us. And why wouldn't he? He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. If if he fought for Jehoshaphat and for the nation of Judah, would he not fight for us? If he would, what would he require? What would he ask of us? Well, I think very similar what he asked of Jehoshaphat. Four things. Number one, he would ask us to clean house. We must tear down the high places in our own lives. We must stop pursuing and chasing after the gods of this world. And we must turn back. We must drain the swamp in our own lives. And number two, we must seek God. We must make it the primary business of our lives to rise each day in the pursuit of righteousness, to pursue God with our whole heart, You see, we can't spend our life running away from God and then be surprised to turn back and he's not there. We must turn back now before it's too late. We must seek him while he still may be found. I think think in the next couple of days it would be appropriate for us together as the church to join in a time of seeking God, a time of fasting, a time of prayer, a time of calling out to God. And then number three, we would need, like the people of Judah, to fearlessly believe, to believe that that God will fight for us, to believe that, that God can win this battle. We'll have to stand firm. We'll have to hold our ground. We'll have to hold on to our faith but we must fearlessly believe. And then finally, like those ancient Israelites, like the men and women of Judah, we must sing praise, number four. We must start singing a a new song. We need to change our tune. We need to proclaim our confidence in God and put our trust in Him. I don't know what's going to happen on Tuesday, but all I know is this, and let me share it to you in a powerful principle that when your heart belongs to God, so do your battles. God will fight for us. So whatever the outcome on Tuesday, the battle rages on, and we will trust trust in God, and we will keep our faith in Him strong and steadfast and sure. I'm glad to be on this journey with you. Today, I'd like to conclude our message with with a special prayer. It's not a prayer that I would invite you to read. I'd like to pray a prayer with you. So wherever you are right now, would you bow your heads with me? And would you close your eyes? And in this very sacred moment, would you join me as we call upon the living God, the same God who delivered Jehoshaphat and the people of Judah? Would you join me in a prayer of faith as we call upon him? Almighty God, We sing your praise. We sing the song of your faithfulness and your goodness 
your righteousness and your mercy. We repent of our sins. We have chased after the gods of this world, and we're sorry. We turn back, and we seek you with our whole heart. We commit the rest of our lives, the rest of our days, to make it our business to seek you first. Father, we fearlessly believe. We put our trust in you. We, we sense you, your hand. We sense you at work in the midst of this battle, and we believe you. Father, go before this nation. We cry out to you for your deliverance, for your salvation. But Father, at the end of the day, whatever the outcome of the battle, we rejoice that you are in control. We love you and we trust you in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, God bless you and thank you so much for joining us today on this very, very important Sunday. God bless you and I'm looking forward to seeing you back here next Sunday. Have a great week. (music) 